Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to be fairly brief and just do more of a storytelling because in horticulture, the strength of my knowledge has come from probably some bad decisions. Like when Mike was talking about some of the mistakes made from pesticides, uh, the ones that really stick with me are the ones that I screwed up on. So I'm going to kind of focus on five just because of time limits, but just know that there's so many things that can go wrong and you don't have to know everything. You don't have to have a PhD and all this stuff to, to really understand it. And my guess is of the 20, 21 people here, many of you have a lot more experience than even us. And so if you have some comments, like Mike said, feel free to chime in or tell your own story. But I just wanted to um, maybe see if we can do this. Okay. <clears throat> when it comes to troubles in the landscape, I have what I refer to as the funnel, the gunnel funnel. And this is how my mind works and how I classify things. Most of the problems I perceive with homeowners and landscape industry professionals, most of them are abiotic, meaning they're non-living. They're not pathogenic. They're not insects. They're just something that we superimpose on the plant. And so as we break that down even further, you know, most of the things that we do see are fungi because even though they were the second driest state, we're the biggest water user per capita. Some say 65, 70% of our culinary water goes on our landscape and it goes on way too much. And so as we start talking about some of these common problems, you'll see that fungal pathogens love cool, wet areas and environments. There are a few bacteria that, and we'll touch on one today, but they're not as prevalent as fun, fungal pathogens. And Mike talked about all the adjunct stuff that he's done in his history. He had a career before extension in teaching. And I, I taught plant pathology for about 10 years adjunct. And I would have our students go out to a park. We'd go through, take notes on all the things we were seeing, come back and compare notes. And that 90% abiotic problems is very accurate. Most of the things that we see and encounter are man-made. You do see a few of those, but beyond that, there's very few viruses. Um, they're a little bit more prolific in the vegetable or annual perennial world, not so much in the woody plant world or trees and shrubs. So just quickly, this is a, a top 10 list of all of the common abiotic problems. They used to be considered diseases, but because they're non-living, we more accurately call them disorders. And of this list, many of them, I would say most of them have something to do with water, water uptake, too much water. And so keep that in mind as we talk. We're going to focus on iron chlorosis in the next couple slides. And then we're also going to touch, like Mike mentioned, on herbicide damage because we see it a lot. So <clears throat> if this is a kind of a refresher or kind of elementary information for you, I apologize, but I do think that it's worth talking about because it's number one problem I see year after year after year. And iron deficiency, iron chlorosis, chlorosis is a general term for yellowing, iron, meaning that's the cause of the, the yellowing, shows up in the new growth of a plant. Iron is immobile, does not move in the soil. It also has a hard time moving within the plant. So that's why you'll see the new growth being deficient. Um, you'll see that intervenal yellowing where the veins stay dark green and the, the tissue in between will be lighter colored. And in extreme conditions, you'll start to get scorched, especially in the heat of summer. Um, I had a pear tree in my yard that got chlorotic so bad that the, the, the new leaves actually were white. They were bleached because they were so deficient. The reason we deal with iron chlorosis in Utah 
and in the Intermountain West is because of our high soil pH. It's a chemistry thing. We have plenty of iron in our soils. If you go down past the point of the mountain, down into Southern Utah, Cedar Breaks area, that red rock is an iron. So we have plenty of iron in our soil. It's just bound so tight to the par particles of soil, the plants have a hard time getting to that iron. And it's not all plants. It's usually plants that are not well adapted to our arid west um, environment. So whenever you do a soil test or you start having problems, nine times out of 10, I can tell you the plant species you're dealing with or that your pH is above 7.5. Other things that make it a problem are saturated soils or cold soils in the spring can really exacerbate the problem or over fertilizing. Part of my master's degree was looking at fertilizer use in tree species. And we found that if the phosphorus levels reached to a certain point, they actually started forming compounds with iron in the soil, making it less available to certain species, like the silver maple pictured here. This lower picture on the left side, this is a Sestina plum. So you can still get chlorosis in yellow or in purple leaf varieties as well. Now, the biggest remedies have to do with basically spoon feeding or supplementing that iron to those plants. And the supplement, the chemical composition that works best in our soils is the EDDHA. And that's the acronym that I tell homeowners to, to search for. There's a lot of different specific products, but I'm not gonna go into those. There are also foliar applications that you can put once the plants have leafed out. That EDDHA is best put down this time of year before things start leafing out. So this is the timeline of, of doing that. Foliar applications, once the, the plants leaf out, it works, but you have to get surfactants and other things to help that stick on the leaf. And you have to do multiple applications as the, as the leaves expand further and further. Trunk injections also are available, but probably my least favorite option because you're physically drilling into the trunk of a tree. So if it's a big state champion tree and you're, you're wanting to save it, then that's okay. But there's other options that, that tend to be a little bit better for younger trees. The best option for iron deficiency is just avoiding species that are very prone to deficiency. This has to, these are the silver maples, amur maples, even quaking aspen outside their native range of 6,500 feet. And then these plants that are in red I wouldn't even try. Now, somebody out there is going to say, well, I have this in my yard, and that's fine, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of supplementing iron to have these plants grow. Now, pin oak is a good example, hydrangeas, azaleas, blueberries. It's our high pH soils that make it really difficult to grow these type of plants. JD. So, go ahead. Yeah, there was a question that came in the chat that um, maybe you could just address. You kind of already mentioned it. What's the best way to apply the EDDHA? So in my experience, it's you mix it in a slurry solution and you pour it around the drip line of the tree. It's a soil application. And we do any of these topics that we discussed today, or at least that I discussed, there's a full on fact sheet online. So if you put in iron chlorosis USU into a Google search, it'll pull up all of the different information. Because I know sometimes this is like taking a drink out of a fire hose. So that's another approach I want to give some information at the end of these websites are perfect places to find this information. One thing I wanted to point out is through plant breeding, there's some great um, alternative species that you have to choose from. You don't have to go with an autumn blaze. You don't have to go with a silver maple. There are other options. This, these hybrids of the truncatum species, Pacific sunset, crimson sunset, ruby sunset, Norwegian sunset, they are a purple blow maple and a Norway maple hybrid. And so, because those species, the parentage doesn't struggle with iron deficiency, these don't either. So there's a lot of options out there. In fact, part of my applied research happens in Kaysville at the USU Botanical Gardens. 
I have a, a seven acre arboretum that has over 400 different species of trees and shrubs that you're welcome to walk through. They're all labeled. Um, you can see some of the more adaptable species. So with iron deficiency, just avoid those problem children, I guess I would call them. Um, herbicide damage. I brought this up because I have seen it way too often. And once you see the problems, there's not a lot you can do. Um, symptomology, oftentimes these are broadleaf weed killers that people spray on their lawns for to kill dandelions or other things. You'll see this cupping and curling. Um, technically it's called epinasty. It's, it's a abnormal growth of cells in elongation. You can get some prominent veins you can see this tree on the left or on the right side here, rather. This is an oak on campus. Um, I probably shouldn't throw too many people under the bus here, but even professionals screw up. And you can see that, that downward pucker on the tree leaf is very indicative to a chemical called dicamba. And 2,4-D is in most broadleaf weed killers. There's a lot of combination, trimex, speed zone, there's a whole bunch of them out there. But 2,4-D is kind of the basic, one of the older chemicals. It was it was developed in during World War II in the 1940s and really helped um, farmers produce a lot more grain during that time. So it's, it's got a, lot, a really rich history of being safe um, if used correctly, like Mike was saying. But dicamba is a newer one that if you read the label, it will specifically say, do not use dicamba near the roots of woody plants. It says that right on the label. But nobody tends to read that. And so I've seen a lot of off-target poisoning of woody plants due to dicamba. The problem with 2,4-D that Mike alluded to earlier was it's very temperature sensitive. It will volatize, go from a liquid to a vapor very quickly, almost instantly if the temperature is above 85 degrees. And so you'll, you'll end up killing a lot of the woody plants around. And then soil sterilants, just my opinion is don't use them, period. Because, actually, I should back up. The Department of Ag that regulates these chemicals actually put a survey out a few years ago and asked the agents if we thought soil sterilants should be restricted use. And my opinion was yes, because it's way too easy to go to a nursery by a, a ground clear or vegetation killer, and you put it down on the ground in a pellet form, what happens is it sticks to the soil particle and as it gets wet, that soil moves and that chemical will actually move wherever the water goes. So I've seen a lot of really bad stories um, from soil sterilants. So if you can avoid using them, don't use them. So remedies, stop it. Stop using the soil sterilants. There's a lot better options out there. And to reiterate Mike's points, read the stinking label. It will tell you everything that you need to know and not to do to be safe. JD, I, I, we, go ahead. I just had one comment and, and this kind of comes back to the thing we we're talking about before the dicamba issue that I ran into years ago was that, um, it does, it does say that on these labels, like for soil sterilants, not use them where there, where there's trees in the area, but most people have a hard time understanding what that means. How close does a tree have to be to be in the safe zone? And um, it's almost like if you can see, the, if you can see the tree, <laughs> it's not safe to use a soil sterilant. So because yeah, so they, those roots spread so far, they'll spread across property lines on driveways um, into parking lots, all those kind of areas. And, and most people aren't aware that the tree roots spread far, far, far beyond what the drip line or the canopy of the spread of the tree is. Yeah, the general rule is at least three times the width of the canopy is where the roots are. Yep. So, and as I found out when I did more research on dicamba, oaks are especially sensitive to it early spring. And so it's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy thing, but Again, it all comes back to the label. People get really upset about chemicals and they think that we talk a, too much about them. But the reason we talk about them is because there's a lot of accidents and we, we can avoid those things. 
So <clears throat> shifting gears a little bit, there's a lot of diseases, a lot of pathogens. These are living creatures that feed on other creatures and oftentimes they're parasitic. They're obligated to, to feed on something else to get that nutrition. Fungal pathogens, for example, feed on plants because they can't produce their own food, photosynthesis. And so they'll tap into a plant, they'll literally drill into the plant to steal the nutrients. So ones I wanna focus on, Corinium blight, and then fire blight. And, and in my, I've, I've been down in Salt Lake and Davis County for about 10, 12 years, and then up in Cache County for about three or four. And every year that I've been here, we've had fire blight issues. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit, but first, Crinium blight is a fungus. And like I mentioned before, fungi love cool, wet weather. And so when we have an extended spring with a lot of rain, you can almost guarantee you're gonna start seeing these things. Now, crinium blight in the nursery industry is sometimes referred to as shot hole. And it's because it looks like somebody took buckshot and shot the leaf. You have these little holes. That's the tree's response to targeting and, and dropping those pathogens out and saving themselves. You'll also see as the fruit here on the on the upper right left, this is a, a peach tree that has pock marks or spots. That's the active lesions from that fungus. And sometimes this lower picture indicates you'll have some oozing or gumming. Now I will say gumming is not an, a hundred percent guarantee that it's cranium blight because gumming is just like a symptom of stress. It's like us having a runny nose and saying you have COVID. That's, that's not accurate. There's, it's just your body's way of showing that it's stressed. Could be allergies. And again, the cause, cool, wet conditions. Remedies, um, this includes just pruning, practices that opens up the canopy. There are fungicides that are registered for corinium blight. Um, fixed coppers. There's, again, fact sheet online on corinium blight. I know Mayor deals with this a lot with the fruit growers. Um, but it affects anything with a pit, ornamental or fruiting. Um, the timing of the, of the application is the fall when the leaves are falling off. That kills the overwintering spores. And then again, in the spring, after they bloomed, and the petals all drop off, they call that shuck split. That's what this picture is, is that new baby fruit pushing the flower portions off. That's the other time you would treat to protect that new fruit against infection. Now, one thing to keep in mind with pesticides, like Mike was talking about, you never spray pesticides when things are in bloom because there's pollinators out and, and they're a lot more sensitive to, to the chemicals than we would be. So with fire blight, this is a bacteria. And the difference between bacteria and fungi, bacteria like warm and wet instead of cool and wet. Um, fire blight is very specific as are most, pa most pathogens to apples, pears, hawthorns, mountain ash, pyracantha, but we don't care about that one. Anything in the rosaceous family. And the reason they call it fire blight is that infected tissue looks like it's been scorched by fire. You can see this lower left picture. That's a very indicative strike, they call it, when fire blight enters in through, um, through the blossoms. Now, when fungal pathogens attack, they can drill in. Bacteria don't have a mouth part, so they actually have to have a natural opening, and they have to have free moisture because they have a, a flagella that pushes them through the water. So, open flowers are where this bacteria usually enters in through the tree. The other thing they keep in mind is it has to be warm. Usually that's above 60 degrees and you have to have the presence of water. Now bees can transfer those bacterial um, cells from flower to flower, but it takes active rain splashing that down into the floral tube to actually cause the infection. So with fire blight, the best remedies, if you have it already and you see these blackened areas, you'll prune back eight to 10 inches past any visible um, infection, disinfecting your pruners after each cut so you don't spread that bacteria. 
And that's that's true unless the tree's dormant. It's in the winter time, you typically don't have to worry about um, disinfecting your tools. But if it's actively sat flowing, then you do. The other thing is if it's going to be warm, wet, and trees are in bloom, those three things are present, then you would put down an antibiotic preventative. And again, fact sheet on fire blight, you can read up on all this and get the all the different chemicals. This is just a few, streptomycin, fixed copper, oxytetracycline. And if you're experiencing these things, I would highly recommend reading the fact sheets because like Mike, I have to see things, read things four or five times before it actually sticks. And so make sure you, you do some of the, your own research. Um, switching gears even further, common pests, insects. You can see there's the way we classify insects is how they feed on our plants. There's those that suck, there's those that chew, those that bore, and there's others that, that cause problems too, but we're not gonna get into those. And to save you from headache, I'm not gonna cover these. I'm only gonna talk about one and I'll tell you why I'm talking about it. But you can see insects outnumber humans by far. And the good news is most insects are beneficial. We only struggle with a small percentage of insects. But the ash lilac bore I wanted to talk about because we sell ash trees in Utah. And my goal in my career is to stop that practice. Because like I said, I have 400 different species in Kaysville of really cool ornamental trees and shrubs. I don't have an ash because of this insect, this ash lilac borer. They overwinter inside the tree and they're deep inside the heart of the tree and it's hard for any chemical to reach them. Even the systemics like the imidacloprid, the bear tree and shrub systemic, it won't touch these guys because they're so deep inside the tree. They'll emerge early May and they'll start to, to mate within seven to 14 days. Then those females will lay up to 400 eggs on the bark of a tree. And the best time to treat for these things is a preventative on those new little larvae as they're hatching before they enter in to that, to that bark. Once those insects are inside the tree, there is hardly anything you can do for it. So if you read the fact sheet, you'll, it'll tell you to protect the trunk and major scaffold branches with a, an insecticide. And further and further I go into my career, there's less and less chemicals available to treat for these things. Permethrin, bifenthrin, carbaryl, these are some listed on the, on the fact sheets. Um, but I don't recommend ash trees anymore because of this insect. They're so prevalent and it's, there's so many other better options. I mean, I love ash trees, the fall color, they're hardy as nails, they're everywhere in Utah because they grow. But we have a lot more better options uh, currently. And the other thing I don't like about this pest is you're treating from May clear to August. And these pesticides have maybe a five, seven day residual. So you're you're doing it multiple times in a month just to keep this pest in check. And in my opinion, I don't think it's worth it. The other reason I stopped promoting ash trees is this new pest. This is the uh, emerald ash borer. It's very invasive, very destructive. It was introduced into the United States in 2002, back in Michigan. It is currently spread to over 20 states. Um, last count I saw was almost up to 80 million trees along the East Coast that have been decimated by this insect. And in 2013, they found it in Boulder, Colorado. So scientists think it's just a matter of time before it reaches us. And when it does, if you look at some of the cities around that are older, like I'm from Wellsville, the historic square around Wellsville Tabernacle is all ash and they're 80 plus years old. And if this thing comes in, it's gonna change the whole urban landscape. So again, biodiversity, trying new things. That's the whole reason we have the Arboretum so that people can come and see new species that are adapted. 
This is another one because you're out in the industry working. This is another one to keep your eyes on. And if you come across these, submit them up to campus. We have a pest lab that will identify these. We have an arthropod di diagnostician that will, you can even text a picture and they can usually identify the pest. And Marion can talk a little bit more about that probably, but this Utah pest team is next to none. They, I mean, they are stellar group of scientists, but they are working currently with the Department of Ag in trapping one for the Emerald Ash Borer, but also for this guy. Um, my start of my career is when this hit. And in 2006, they found a bunch of these Japanese beetles in Orem. They declared an emergency within a 10 block radius. They shut everything down. You couldn't grow a garden. They were going through and treating um, all these people's landscapes. And for a few years, it was just constant because this is a pest that will feed on 300 plant hosts. This will decimate the green industry if it get, becomes established. I've visited Michigan. I've been to Nebraska. I've been to these places where they've basically given up because the, the pest is so prolific. And the trees, especially the lindens, it looks like the leaves are just lace because they feed so heavily on them. So Department of Ag was able to really eradicate them back in 2000. 11, I believe. But then in 2012, they caught a couple males. They didn't think too much of it. But lately, I've been hearing rumblings from the Department of Ag that in Salt Lake and Davis County, there's there's been a, a another influx of Japanese beetles. And they take it very seriously because if, if these insects come into our industry, it's not just us having to control them. It's we can't ship plants. There's quarantine issues with these insects. So again, because you're out and about, if you ever have questions with problems you're facing, realize that Mike's down in Utah County, I'm in Cache County, but there's one of us in every county in Utah. And so you can contact anyone in Extension and we are paid to help you. That's our whole job is service. So with that,